So now moving on to our local problem, uh, which is Toki. I'm just going to call her Toki. I mean, we all know who I'm talking about here, and I'm going to say who, because she's not a what. Um, and I hope to kind of explain that, but I don't think I need to. I think this is a pretty knowledgeable crowd here. I think you all are familiar with the campaign, with her and all that. So I'm going to be kind of brief and then pretty much open to Q&A because uh, you, know, you may have some questions above and beyond what, what I'm going to present here. Um, but anyway, you know, that's where we start. That's where she is uh, 24 hours a day for 47 and counting years oh. in just that tank. And this is how she spends most of her time. Of course, she does two 20-minute shows a day, and she's not allowed to make any calls during that time, except for those god-awful siren calls that they use to demonstrate that, yes, she can make noise. But after hours, she calls to her family. I don't know if she knows she's <coughs> 3,000 miles away. Uh, last she saw ocean was the Seattle waterfront, which she was familiar with, but in pen. Um, but she's still calling to her family, and that tells me so much, because it means she's not only <coughs> able to do that, that she has those calls in her memory, but that that means she remembers her family, her life before capture, where she came from, her home. It's fresh, it's still vivid in her mind, and that's the point that I'm trying to get across to everybody, really but the decision makers, especially the owners, the judges, the politicians, the, the people who are influencing public opinion, that she knows where she came from. All they know is that she's been in that little box and that she performed. She's their Elvis, but you know, she was not born there. And she was raised. I mean, literally, she was brought up. She was taught by her mother and her family how to be not just any orca, but a southern resident orca. How to catch fish, everything that she needs to know. She has. And I don't know if I have to refresh you about their neuroanatomy, but you know, their brains are, by a very recent paper, the largest of any brain on earth larger than sperm whales. It's been believed that sperm whales had bigger brains. Those were early estimates from decades ago that measured only juvenile orcas with adult sperm whales. But once you compare age classes, they actually have larger brains than sperm whales. And more convolutions, more of you know, everything that goes into associational uh, cognitive memory capacity she all orcas have and so obviously she does and why would she forget her home and family those are the most important things to know for an orca so anyway but that's how she has to do it and you know when you talk to you or well hear from uh, hostages, human hostages, decades in captivity. What they say is that they kept their sanity by remembering their home and family. She's kept her sanity. <clears throat> I don't know how. I would say she's a stable genius, if that's not now <laughs> <laughs> But she is. She's incredibly stable. And not all orcas are. Orcas, as powerful and as, as competent as they are, a lot of them crack. Her tank mate Hugo, captured about a year before she was, lasted a little over 10 years, and he just repeatedly banged his head against the walls and the windows, broke a five-inch thick viewing window, 
and cut off the tip of his rostrum at the time. It had to be sewed back on, but he soon after died of a brain aneurysm, according to the official necropsy. So they don't all last, and they all die young before their normal lifespans. And yet, 47 years and counting, and she is incredibly healthy. Her teeth are all in good shape. She doesn't have That's any amazing. systemic uh, infections or, uh, you know, I mean, she has stress-related <coughs> issues. She has ulcers. She has, uh, you know, some problems, and they do medicate her. And of course, we don't know exactly, you know, how much, how often, but sure, she gets some antibiotics and she gets some stress medications and. And we're not sure for you know what else, but you know all orcas get those, and most of them die young. And she's 50, give or take a year or two, and she is in good, good shape. The trouble is that works against her. Yeah. Yeah, because for one thing, the aquarium says that's a tribute to our good care. <laughs> no, I think it's her. It's her character, her strength. When Dr. Jesse White came to Seattle to select among the captives to take to Miami, he chose her. And he said it was because she was so courageous. I don't know how he knew this, but he did. He was, he was really prescient about this. So courageous and yet so gentle. Boy, there's, there's a, a role model to live up to, and it's it's true to this day. She just maintains her her mental balance and health, and I, I don't know really how she does it. But it also just worked against her last week oh. when the appeal of the dismissal of the case that we were part of against the Sequarium for violating the Endangered Species Act, which says you cannot harm or harass. Uh, a, an endangered animal uh, that was dismissed, kicked out of court, uh, because that's not harm. That's not harassment, they said. We don't see the life-threatening problem. Huh, there is. She's just somehow overcoming it. I don't know how much longer. Okay, well, anyway, uh, this again demonstrates that she remembers her family. This was 1995, Dateline NBC played her family to her. That was a great example of ambush journalism because that was not authorized. Uh, they just snuck in, well, I mean, they were gonna interview some trainers, but they just went ahead in with this little digital player and two cameras and uh, Keith Morrison played that and she came up to listen. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a behavioral clue that she remembers. Uh, oops. Uh, so, we have our proposal. And it's on the web. And actually, I'll get to that. I've, I've kind of juggled some uh, slides around here a little bit to augment the show. Uh, because what I had before was just a segment of a show I'm going to give next week to Sound Waters, so uh, I put some more in just to sort of amplify and give me a chance to add lead. Uh, so you'll find that on the web. Uh, it's a, you know, hour complete to date. It's still a work in progress. It always is. We'll add to it as we develop more. Uh, but it's it's the plan it's the way to do it the step by step from the pre-transport preparations of her and of uh, all the equipment needed the sling that has to be custom made uh, and the, the container everything you know will have to be prepared and, all, and and of course as clive said with the dolphins at Barcelona, we want to do it first class, professional, everything right up to the standards. And there are standards. It's not like this hasn't been done. Orcas are shipped around all the time. And Keiko is the best example, at least, of a movement to natural waters. And of course, he did 
fantastically. He loved Iceland. He loved the habitat. He just didn't find his family. Family is as important as habitat. Mm -hmm. So, um, any story about Toki really kind of has to start with that because that's where the trauma began. Penn Cove, August 1970, uh, the mass roundup. And we're not sure that that is her, but uh, she went through that, netted up, hoisted up onto a old you know, bed of a flatbed truck with a mattress on it and uh, hauled down to Seattle and put into a sea pen for, as a commodity to be sold. But that's what she does today. And she does two 20-minute shows a day and she does amazing breaches. She's longer than that tank is deep in the middle and it's a bathtub so it slopes down to the middle at where it's 20 feet long and yet she is able to somehow kick her flukes and come literally completely two or three feet out of the water sometimes. I don't know how she's got that power but she does. She's still got that energy. And of course you've seen that. That's the limit of it. 47 and a half years. Uh, so you can't memorize all this and it gets really complicated and uh, these are you know all the cases and the dismissals. Uh, just want to draw attention to two that are well really one maybe that is still pending uh, which is the suit against the USDA. That's the second suit against the USDA but this one is because when Parcos Rio Nidos bought this aquarium, that's a new owner. And by the regulations, you can't just pass the permit on to a new owner. You have to do a new inspection and validation that there are no violations. They didn't do that. And there are violations. They're egregious. They're obvious. The tank size, the no protection from the midday Miami sun, uh, and her solo status, that she is alone in that tank. Um, those are explicit violations of the, of the USDA Animal Welfare Act that USDA is supposed to administer. Um, so that is still pending, but that's been a year and a half. Can you say foot dragging? Uh, the court uh, is just not wanting to rule on this. Because they know the law is in our favor, but if they rule according to that law, they're going to shut down the whale stadium. And they're going to require that she move somewhere. And uh, they have certainly been advised. I mean, it's, you know, there's really only one solution to that, and that's ours. And this aquarium has spent, you know, 50 years, and the whole industry has spent 50 years swamping public opinion with the idea that once in captivity, always in captivity, they can never go back. And therefore, our plan won't work. And so that's what, you know, the public still believes. They may believe captivity is a terrible thing now. That's great, and that's a big shift. That's only step one. Then they've got to go to step two and say, okay, well, let's figure out the very best way to put them back in the ocean. And the public isn't there yet, and so the courts are not there yet. And so they make these ridiculous claims, like there's no harm in harassment to being stuck in a concrete box for 47 years, uh, even though, and they refuse to rule on the, the obvious violation of the permit regulations, uh, just because they don't want to rule in our favor. Uh, and then just, you know, January 11th, the appeal of our ESA appeal of the dismissal uh, was dismissed. So the legal team is now figuring out the next move. There may be a further appeal, but where is that going to go? To the Supreme Court? That won't help. Um, <coughs> So, I'm not sure what the next move is on that, if there is one. So, on the other front, which is uh, this new, amazing, uh, just overwhelming 
support and involvement, engagement of the Lummi tribe, the Lummi Council, the governing body of the Lummi Nation, voted unanimously uh, just last August, August 1st actually, to completely support the return of Toki to their ancestral waters. As a family member, they, she's sacred to them. She is, she is their possible ancestor. They, they're not messing around. They take this very, very seriously. And of course, they have uh, uh, the capability, they have the admin ability, they have a nation, they have a, 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 they have a non-profit foundation that they have set up for this uh, to, uh, to receive funds for all this. Um, and they're developing, negotiating strategies right now. Um, so, We'll see what happens. Um, this was uh, Nicholas when he announced that at uh, our August 8th event in uh, Coopville on Penn Cove. We have an annual capture commemoration event. You're all invited every August 8th, uh, or give or take a day if necessary, but uh, usually August 8th. So uh, the hereditary chief the head of the council uh, and the council member and uh, a whole, actually a busload of, of lummies came to our event to make this announcement. So we were thrilled, I am thrilled. And we had a little gathering over on uh, Orcas Island a couple of weeks ago to uh, plan uh, at least the, the first step the next step in this process, which will be the totem journey. Uh, there is right now, Jewel James, the master carver, uh, is working on a 35 foot cedar log of massive dimensions uh, that will be the image of Toki in a native motif. I have no idea what his artistic talent will bring us, but uh, that will be taken by a flatbed truck uh, across the country uh, to Los Angeles and then with several stops. Well, first, some events here, Bellingham, Coopville, um, not sure what's all on the itinerary, but uh, then to Miami. Uh, and there is also a documentary in production right now. In fact, that's a lot of what we were doing. Uh, let's see, uh, some folks here. Uh, they must be in this. Oh, God, I don't see them. Uh, are making a doc. I guess they've already taken off. Uh, a documentary. Um, and so the trailer is being produced, and so they're getting interviews for that. So that trailer will be ready by May 1st, which is when this is going to happen. And so it will accompany not only the trip, but all the media uh, around this trip to build up the anticipation for the arrival in Miami. Um, so what it's all aiming toward, and it's so great to get this wholehearted endorsement of our plan, of the plan, uh, for Toki to return to their ancestral home waters, which include Orcas Island. The Lummies are very closely related to the uh, Sammamish. Oh, the, the Samish actually. It's, mm -hmm. There's a U.S. and a Canadian Samish. Anyway, they are um, on Vancouver Island, and really all of the waters in between for 10,000 years have been Lummies uh, and others. I mean, but they, they have lived there, occupied that land and water, of course. They're water people, community people. So they knew these orchids. You know, they're deep in their mythology. And 
So this is Orcas Island. That's East Sound. Nice and protected, but large enough for lots of tidal flow and cleansing and flushing. So it's it's good, pure, pristine, really. Um, ocean water. There's there's really no pollution. In fact, there's an oyster farm right over here, uh, and it's just an ideal site. Uh, it's been the site for now about four years, and the owner. Uh, is uh, Jim Youngbrin, who lives there with his family, has for decades, and operates a, a hatchery, which is a very experimental, innovative idea for a hatchery, where there were no salmon before, uh, just a spring. And so he uh, built some ponds and a whole hatchery operation there to, uh, to grow Chinook. In the mid-80s, he began this. And uh, he lets hundreds of thousands, it varies year to year, but of uh, smolts out after they become imprinted on that water, after they've been raised in those ponds in that creek. Uh, so then they come back, and it may be 1,500 or 2,000 or so, but you know, good sized Chinook. Uh, it's kind of a drop in the bucket to the whales, it's some. You know, I mean, it's some food for them now and then, but it's, a, it's an example. And some others are now being developed along these lines because it's working. So when I asked him four years ago, would he like to host Toki on his property? <laughs> he came back with a total yes. He said, yeah, since you asked, I can't get that out of my mind. It's a great idea. Let's do this. And I didn't know until then that he actually built his hatchery to feed the orchids. He was way ahead of his time. This was before it was known, at least scientifically, that they needed those salmon. Mm -hmm. uh, but he saw that and developed that, and so, I mean, he's all about orchids. He was a, a part of uh, what's called the Project Interspeak, uh, which had a big conference and published a booklet um, many years ago. Uh, that is very, very uh, far-reaching, very uh, uh, insightful about orcas, about their natural history. Anyway, so he had it all down a long time ago. Um, and so it was, it's just a natural. Not only that, yes, Cindy? I was just hoping I could add something um, yeah. really sweet. That I visited that hatchery a couple of years ago, and Jim Younger had a big tub that he had set aside, and it was full of little salmon fry that he was saving for cookies. Right, oh, right. The thing I could ever see. <laughs> so. Those are now about a year and a half old and they've got their own pond. <laughs> yeah. well, he is right. really into this. He is so into this. It's so great. Um, and not only that, but his property, the hatchery and all, and the sea pen site uh, are being purchased by the Lemmy family. So, um, that's been underway, uh, you know, all parties are real enthusiastic about it. So, uh, you know, I mean, the hatchery will continue, those fish will stay in that pond and until they have to be released, but more will be grown if necessary. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's just, it's, it's ideal in every, you know, natural parameter of the water quality, the depth, the location, the ability to enclose it. Um, and that's what it looks like from the shore, uh, from those rocks right there. Well, you know, a short span of very much the same kind of copper alloy, mm -hmm. you know, net across there. And then from here across, it's about eight or 900 feet, depending on where you tie up exactly, uh, to the other side of that cove. Um, what sort of depth does that mean? <coughs> about 50 feet. 50 feet. Yeah, there's about a 10 foot tide span, so you know it can go from 50 to 60 or so at the depth. Um, Is there a mean water temperature assessment, for instance? Do you know? Uh, it's your standard, what there is, which is in the upper 40s, 48, 49. Right. And what she has at this aquarium, uh, I haven't taken the temp, but uh, they say that it is chilled to 55. Mm -hmm. So, but certainly she'll enjoy this. 
uh, last week when they had that uh, cold snap and the temps were in the low 40s in Miami, uh, a friend went and taped the show and she was just more energetic than ever. She loved it. That was her kind of air, nice and chilly. So she will recognize it and love it. So that it's still kind of washed out, but uh, that is the plan. The net there. The net there, and then an internet. Mm -hmm. uh, our advisors tell us that she w might be uh, shocked by all that space, yeah. even you know, out mm -hmm. to the 900. Uh, so there will need to be a, a sort of an internet to start with. Uh, so and there will be you know gates on these for boats. And this will be a sort of a you know a anchored barge that will be used. Uh, we'll have a slide out that you know one side of it will go into the water at a at a nice easy angle, so and and very smooth material, so you can slide up onto it for physicals, basically, you know, to be able to look at her. Uh, so you know, and. There can be, you know, temporary quarters. We don't have a building like you have there to renovate and build into labs and living quarters. But we have space. Uh, it's right over here. You can't really see it there, but um, it's, you know, good level land uh, for some, you know, we envision temporary uh, structures that will have, you know, the wet lab for fish preparation for veterinary uh, materials, analysis, everything, um, and also for crew quarters, because uh, they'll need to be there too, of course. Uh, so, you know, all of all of the elements of it are completely ready. I mean, they're, you know, ready to purchase. You know, we, we haven't put them on site yet. The site is, is just you know, ready for it. Uh, but what is really important, I think, to me, is our protocols, our attitude, our, our way of dealing with her. And I think one of the really big issues with Keiko, and, you know, this is kind of disputed, and I wasn't on scene, so I'm getting this from uh, different people and it may be, and I think it was very different at different times, but that the sort of overriding philosophy was that what you needed to do with Keiko was turn your back on it. You had to avoid eye contact, do not offer any kind of companionship, any, you know, nice words. Uh, you just force him to go out and be a wild whale because, you know, you, you cut him off. Well, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think it's necessary, and I think it's terrible. I think it just causes trauma. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the, the idea is that he imprints, you know, mm -hmm. like a, a baby goose, you know. If you walk them across the road, they'll stay with you. But, you know, he's way, and she is way, way smarter than that, and can recognize the difference between a human and an orca, especially <laughs> her family. So I think, you know, give her all the unconditional love and attention while she's there 24-7, um, even, you know, exercise with her. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know how, you know, I mean, she, she needs to kind of work out and stuff, but not routines and not conditional on food. Not, not okay, do a trick on food. You're going to get fit. It's always here. Here, all you want. Uh, now let's play. And if she wants, we play. And the the whole progress. You know, we have our our theories about how this is going to play out. Um, you know, we think that she's going to just respond beautifully to the to her native waters. That her stress symptoms are going to clear up. Her ulcers. I don't know of any skin problems. I think she's got maybe a little bit of sunburn here and there. Uh, but all of that, you know, will clear up in short order, days, weeks, a month. And 
her health will improve, her uh, comfort, her, her interest in her waters will uh, you know, grow as, you know, as she gets better. And she'll start, we'll see by her body language, that she's kind of, you know, looking over. She's, she's you know, orienting toward the, toward the net to get to the other side, what's over there? And with the okay of the veterinary staff, um, we'll take her out. We'll accompany her uh, and take her for walks. And of course, Keiko was given the same opportunity and just go with her and see where she wants to go. And she, you know, may come back. You know, we won't call her back. I don't think you need to do that. They did with Keiko, and I think that really confused him and, and mm -hmm. messed up his ability to reintegrate. They were trainers. They wanted control. Mm -hmm. So they continually mm -hmm. called her back if they got nervous that he was out there. I don't think that's a good idea. I think you need to give her the options. Give her the, the agency, as it's called, you know, the ability to make her own choices. And go with her for a time and see how she does. And that as her stamina, which is good now, but you know, it's gotta be a little bit compromised from all those years, maybe a lot. Uh, but as, as she regains her strength and stamina, and moves further and just, you know, acts like a normal orca. Uh, then we don't have to accompany her. But we'll always have a care station, always be ready to provide for her, always have a freezer full of fish or a pond full of live fish uh, to be able to give to her. And she'll always know where that is. So, uh, she can come back if she needs to. She can explore her old backyard. Um, she can find her family. And, you know, that's where it gets, you know, heart fluttering is the idea that she's going to meet up with her family. You know, we suspect from 10, 20 miles away, she's going to hear them in their normal chatter. And she's going to call back in their dialect. And they're going to say, who? What's <laughs> 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 And uh, you know, it'll be pretty fascinating. Um, Charles Vinnick talks about a, a overhead view from the chopper of Keiko when he met up with some wild whales mm -hmm. out there. And they were sort of traveling along. And when they heard him, at first they stopped. And then they split into three groups. Two groups went sort of, you know, way around the perimeter. Another group approached him. So they did it very methodically. You know, they sort of, how will we deal with this new situation? <laughs> so I would say, you know, a delegation and hopefully her presumed mother, L25 Ocean Sun, will come over and see are you who I think you are? Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I have a, you know, an idealistic notion, maybe, that there will be that recognition. And there will be the beginning of the rebuilding of those bonds, of, that, of the trust. I, you know, what seems to happen a lot to, to build trust is that ritual of sharing food. And so I don't know, you know, if she can grab a fish, she may take it to them. They may take a fish to her. You know, some, some uh, bond like that will be built. And I think it'll go well. We have to have plan B, of course. We have to have the contingency plan of care in perpetuity. We have to have the care station, the provisions, the veterinarians on call. We have to be you know, ready for it not to work and for her to come back and be taken care of. That's not out of the question, but uh, I 
I give her a little more credit than most of the experts do, I have to say. I think she'll do very well. Well, um, Toki would like to know if you have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I have two questions. The one on the court ruling that hasn't happened yet, is there the possibility that the end result could be that she might be out of where she is now, but they put her into another captive situation? Right. If they rule that that permit is illegal, um, that shuts down the whale stadium. They can't take money. So yeah, they, they'll need to divest and she'll have to go somewhere. But where? Mm -hmm. I mean, if they have that problem, um, I, you know, it's so unprecedented, it's really hard to say. There isn't any hard and fast rule that says they can't ship her. Um, the only place they could ship her would be to Marine Land Antibes in southern France, which is owned by the same company, Parcus Rio Nidos. However, go ahead, Clive. Talking of that place, I went over there two years ago. It's built on a floodplain. There were horrendous floods mm -hmm. in France, mm -hmm. you might remember it, mm -hmm. and That's Valentin... October, I believe. Huh? October, I believe, or no, I can't remember. Recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have difficulty remembering what five year, five minutes ago was. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I got you. Anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, built on a floodplain, how ludicrous is that? There is absolutely no protection from mm -hmm. any future flooding. Valentin died there. So essentially, it would be a ludicrous mm -hmm. facility for any further animal mm -hmm. to be put into. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Utterly and, dangerous. And France has issued regulations that are yet to be completely formalized, but the whatever Department of Environment or whatever has issued regulations that tighten up the requirements, the size, well, that, you know, require much more expansion than they could possibly mm -hmm. afford. Mm -hmm. uh, just like in the UK in the early 90s, that ended captivity for whales and dolphins. And France is going down the same route. So Antibes is in its last days. Uh, so I don't think that's an option. I don't think SeaWorld is an option for a couple of reasons. For one, any expert, captive or not, is going to tell you she probably won't get along with those whales. Mm -hmm. There's going to be social dislocation, tension, there could be, you know, aggression. It won't work out well for her. She may not survive long if she goes to SeaWorld. And they don't want, you know, her to bring all the protesters and all the controversy <laughs> and all. Right. They don't need more bad publicity right now. You know, so I don't think that SeaWorld would want her where else. Mm -hmm. So you know, there really isn't any other option. Uh, that's at least how I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan, you had a question? Yeah, I just had a, a, how about the, uh, Clyde had been talking about the material for the net pens that they're looking at, at their facility. What, what is the type of nets that we're, you're looking at? For? Uh, pretty much the same thing. That's mm -hmm. exactly what we need, a copper alloy. Not nets. Yeah. They're not nets. No, no, they're no, we're getting away from the word nets. Okay. Yeah. Because it still implies captivity. So right. my suggestion is we call them boundaries. They're safety boundaries, if you like. Okay. okay. Because a lot of people misconstrue that. We know what they are, but the general public will misconstrue it as, well, they're still behind nets. What was that? Do word? you know what I mean? So we call it a safety boundary. Liquid boundary. We call it a liquid boundary. Liquid. Liquid, 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 liquid boundary. boundary. Yeah. So, but yeah, same material, you know, anti. Uh, where you build up, you know, right. copper, copper alloy. alloy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And I just, I'm just at, creatively thinking, she's there, El Pod comes by, hears her, they connect, and there's this liquid boundary between them. Do you, what, what do you What'll envision happen? happening? <laughs> do you lift the nets? Or well, if, yeah, what is, if that happens. You know, they don't often come into East Sound, and it's right. not for sure if their calls from Harrow Strait would make, you know, all the corners. Right, right. Um, but that happens, and actually j went in there when J-50 was born, right. at 4 a.m. the morning before yep. J-50, so probably was born right there yeah. at the C-Pin site, by the way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it could happen. 
Yeah. Uh, I think they will talk to each other across the nets. I think there will be this amazing orca conversation that we hope to record 12 different ways, yeah. <laughs> video and audio. Uh, and uh, if, if it's positive, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. You know, that would depend on her health parameters. If sure. she's in good shape yeah. and that happens and, and it's, you know, approaching time to open the net anyway, I'd say open the gate. We're just hoping they make that connection. Yeah. 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 Are there, will there be hydrophones or is that oh a hydrophone plan? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. there won't be any other than maybe, you know, the very uh, occasional small guided tours, you know. There may be an interpretation center up across the road, half mile away. But, uh, you know, other than that, no viewing on site, really. But yeah, I, I think we'll have the webcams, the hydrophones in the water. Unlike the Keiko project from day one, which was sort of under a cloak of corporate secrecy with very controlled, sporadic uh, information release, um, I, I would like to just let the public in on progress daily. Uh, you know, have not only you know live web feeds, but you know someone there, you know, just logging. Yeah. Uh, what did she look like? What was given to her? Her medical parameters? Uh, you know, I mean, everything. Let the public in on the excitement and the adventure of it. I think that'll, you know, not only build contributions, you know, help make it happen, but just the story is is the effect on us. You know, I mean, this is for her, but. The effect on us of the the of being in her story, being with her in that time, and her being in her home habitat draws attention not just to her but to her whole habitat, and to okay, what's the condition of the water? What's the where are the prey? What do we need to make sure that she and her family therefore do well and. You know, there are a lot of answers. Most of it is salmon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's salmon restoration of every kind. You know, the levees are very upfront about this. They want this whole project to draw attention to the Salish Sea mm -hmm. because that's what's sacred to them. Mm -hmm. And that will help them protect the Salish Sea. Uh, yes, back there. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, you talked about the totem. Is it going to be, a, will it be coming down to Coopville? Um, I'm not positive. Yeah, I, I, it certainly should. Be right. yes. uh, it should. Yes, it should. Right. 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 right, right. I would definitely vote that way. Um, yes, Wendy. Thinking about the boat traffic in the Salish Sea at large mm -hmm. and training her to go on walks with boats, what kind of mitigation plan is there, if any, once her protectors mm -hmm. are not with her all the time to keep her from meeting Luna's fate, you know, inappropriately approaching boats and putting herself at risk? Well, Luna died, uh, <clears throat> most of you know, but uh, he was for five years up at Nootka Sound, he just wandered in, um, and uh, he died under a tugboat because he was going there for companionship. He was just going there to play, to you know, hang out with some people. And they cranked it up and you know, those, what were the eight, 10 foot diameter props, uh, just suddenly whirred into gear and he got sucked right into them. Uh, so my, my theory about that is that when she has a place to go to get real quality time with her companions, her known trusted friends, she'll go there for companionship if that's what she wants. I'm not, you know, I don't see how she's gonna just hang around boats. I mean, Luna was getting into all kinds of mischief to get attention. He was breaking rudders. He was doing all kinds of things and the, the law handed down, you know, was, uh, you know, giant fines. If you give Luna eye contact, if you pay him any attention, how frustrating is that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I just, you know, she, she may, I mean, she may go talk to people, but I don't, I, you know, 
can't prevent every possible accident. You know, I, I don't, I don't think that's likely. But uh, you can't say we have a safeguard exactly against that. We mm -hmm. can't put cages around every prop up there. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, more questions? Live? Yeah, just coming back to, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Wendy. No, it was this lady here. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned acoustics and hydrophones. I think and would suggest that that's as important as visual observations that will naturally take place when these animals are released into the pens because so much work has been done on on acoustics these days, people are doing PhDs in it, mm -hmm. that it's going to be a really important time. So I think the signals and the, and the communication between these animals, um, to log that, to record it, to recognize it, when this happens, Absolutely. is going to be very, very important indeed. So I think you know, true experts will, will be required to interpret what's, what's going on here. You know, and I was interested to hear the, the appraisal that you maybe you're thinking that 10 miles roughly, acoustically, That's one killer to another. That's original wisdom, yeah. I don't know how, how that works actually, but I, I would suggest it's possibly longer than that. I uh, would do. On, on the basis that, um, if you take a, a big fin well, okay, I know it's a different animal, and I know it's got bigger lungs, and it's probably got a louder voice and everything else. But that can be heard from one side of the Atlantic to the other. That's what I've heard. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, right. So proven by uh, by submarine work, yeah. for Part instance. Of that so is because you know, so frequency is so low too. Whereas right. The orca's frequency is much higher, which is a And yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But I'm, uh, I'm suggesting that's that's sort of straight line communication, and they actually use these uh, thermocline so far channels, you know, that are that are like echo chambers that, mm. that are mm. like yelling through a tube. Mm. So, you know, they know how to use ocean conditions to convey mm. their voices. Mm. Um, but also, the, the only other clue that we have that you write, that, that it's more like minimum 20 miles, mm. is that some uh, orcas were heard on the lime kiln hydrophones that were 20 miles away mm. yeah. off Port Angeles. So, I'm, I'm sure they can, but it's just that there are convolutions. There's a San Juan Channel and there's a couple of islands in between to get to East Sound, and sounds lose a lot going around corners. Mm. Yes, Suzanne? You had mentioned to me once that the Whale Sanctuary Project had not bought into this, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, are the Lummi reaching out to them to get them to come around and endorse this? Uh, n not to my knowledge, but I am. Um, I've, I've written to them with a complete description of the plan to, to basically their board of directors and, and uh, you know, I, I know, you know, half the staff pretty right. well. Um, uh, they, and, I and the best result I have was uh, really about a month ago. Charles Vinnick, executive director of Whale Sanctuary Project, and Jeff Foster, who has a very checkered history and still is very much in the industry, but also is uh, willing to help with, you know, sanctuary projects. Uh, he worked with Ingrid for a couple of years to release two Turkish dolphins, and you know, went to Turkey for you know months at a time and designed a whole program that worked that got those dolphins were in abysmal conditions back into the ocean. Um, so he's he's happy to do that, but you know, who butters his bread, you know, and, and so he will take checks to go help, you know, train, acclimatize, transport dolphins. I don't know, you know, I, I'm from, I mean, anyway, uh, checkered history, but anyway, he's been, I, I met him over 20 years ago, um, and he, helped as a teenager with the Penn Cove captures and worked for SeaWorld to capture workers off Iceland. So, you know, um, a wealth of expertise and yet, you know, you, you wish you could pay him so he didn't have to do that, I think, is, is the issue. Anyway, they came to Langley. We had a big long coffee up at the, the coffee shop and came down here. They toured the whale center. Uh, they saw the, you know, the remains of the calf that died during the Pencove captures. 
uh, they saw that we're a going concern here. And they looked over the brochures, and we have those brochures. They're over there. Yeah, good. Um, of the entire plan. Um, and, you know, we were able to go over all the details, and, and Jeff, uh, you know, came up with a few helpful hints, like I didn't know, but uh, it is now uh, against regs or policy to have salt water on an airplane. I don't know, did you know that? Mm -hmm. Maybe not in, the, in, the, in Europe, but um, mm -hmm. so that you have to have fresh water in the tank with her across the country. You can have her in salt water, but then you have to change her over. Empty the salt water, put in fresh water before she goes in the plane, and after she comes out, she, you know, the tank gets refilled with salt water. And of course, new, you know, giant loads of ice to keep it cool. Um, you know, a little tip like that, I didn't know. So he at least, you know, is willing to really help us brush up on the fine point details of how to get this project done. He's got a trainer's perspective that I don't always agree with. She has to be trained to catch fish. I wouldn't use that word because she knows how to catch fish. Like riding a bike is the phrase that comes to mind, you know. I mean, when she has the opportunity, she could be rescued <coughs> first, but she's got those skills. So, so it's not that they are opposing because they're hoping that they'll be the ones to save her. I, well, they've never explained their rationale to me, but... They, have they opposed it, or they just haven't... They've, they've uh, criticized it without foundation in the media. As, uh, well, we haven't got our permits yet. Well, you know, we don't have a time frame. Uh, but actually, we do need, I think we could get now, uh, a sort of uh, the first permit which would be a, a Department of Natural Resources, uh, you know, aquatic survey, hydro, hydraulic permit it's called, to uh, make sure there's no eelgrass that might be, you know, wiped out, that there's gonna be no damage to the bottom. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we can, we can do that. I, you know, that won't be a problem, but and the rest, you know, to go to NOAA at this point, because she is an ESA protected you know, animal, um, would be premature and would backfire. Because if you ask them hypothetically, uh, I, I think the knee jerk reaction, they don't want that controversy, right. you know, they don't want to say yes to this, so they're going to say no, and then that's going to be on record as the permit. Mm -hmm. So you really need to, you know, have a time frame. Uh, you know, then go, and we have a lot of good political pull, actually. We know, we know people. Uh, you know, between Jim Youngren and the Lummies and many other associates, supporters, uh, they know the people to go to to get those permits without having to just make a cold call. So, uh, you know, we'll get it done when the time comes, but if we do it ahead of time, I think we backfire. So anyway, you know, if that's all they're going to say, you know, uh, you know, let's talk about that. But you know, where's the note of support? Where's the moral support? Um, you might be interested to know that we've had exactly the same experience. Okay. Exactly. With the totally, World Centric project. Totally negative. Yeah. Not Just positive in any way. Actually, to the point, I have the letters that are downright rude. Now, why? Right. When we're like-minded people, we're trying to do the right thing by these animals, and you would expect that each organization would support each other, it doesn't seem to be the case. But we would still, uh, how he might be more diplomatic about it than I would be, but we would still hope that they will turn a little bit here and just see the benefit. But maybe what, what, what how he's saying is they want to say no, because if it doesn't work, then they're not going to be associated with it. The, the reason I ask is not to badmouth them, I'm just trying to figure right. out if there's some way that, um, well, one, to understand, and then two, to see if there's some way that we as advocates can help to turn that ship. Right, and it's really important because they are the highest profile you know, authorities in the public mind on how to do this. Right. 
And so if they're going to be negative about it, you know, then what are the judges going to do? They don't know. What are the owners going to do? You know, when our delegation goes to Madrid to talk to headquarters, you know, they're going to say, well, the experts say, you know. Um, so it's really, really important. Um, I, did, I don't know quite how to do it. Actually, I, I did a, a Facebook post when that last, you know, appeal of the appeal was dismissed. Uh, that might have sounded a little desperate, I don't know, but um, you know, what I said was the opinions of experts, of the recognized experts, is really important. We, we need that support, you know, some kind of moral support, some kind of positivity about what we're doing. Um, and I've sent a lot of emails around and, and gotten basically nothing or something negative back uh, just, you know, they don't want to go near it until they all go near it, until it's the new consensus. And, you know, so it's just, there's this log jam. Uh, you know, so I, I asked everybody, contact whatever whale and dolphin experts you know, and ask them if they'll support this. If they get, you know, a lot of requests like that, they may have to, you know, think about, well, how does that make them look? Um, a month or no, a couple of months ago, there was a big feature story in the Miami Herald that they've been working on since August, and we thought, okay, this is great. You know, they're actually going to theoretically, you know, look into the whole project, and they're going to tell people how it's going to work. Looking forward to this, and then when it came out, it was a hatchet job. It was brutal, and there was a five-minute video with it. And uh, Naomi was, was interviewed and just reporting what she said, um, well, you know, first she said the idea you can just plop them in the ocean. She wasn't, well, I mean, it was about Toki. So, you know, she didn't say their idea. She just said, you know, the idea, uh, which we don't have, that you can just plop them in the ocean and they'll be fine. You know, that won't work, uh, of course. Um, so. That was not helpful, but then she said, oh, she definitely has to get out of that tank. It's a terrible place, which everybody agrees with. But all the way across the country? I don't think so. What? <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, what difference does it make if it's 200 or 2,000 miles? It's, you know, a couple more hours, that's not a problem for... So, you know, I don't understand that it, she's sort of being positive and then negative. So she's good with all the anti-captivity people and then she's good with all the pro-captivity people. You know, so I think it's sort of keeping herself safe. So, so the anyway, flip Wendy. Side of these big organizations that you were just discussing, there, there are the kind of little one-offs as I see them, Rick O'Berry and Pete Bethune, who are out there just grabbing dolphins, doing what they do, putting them back out successfully. Uh, with oh, very yeah. little funding and very little fanfare and very little support, they just go, they get them, they do it. Uh, in Pete's case, he literally stole one, which I don't recommend, but still, he, yeah, they're it's little, working. They're... And Rick is having some real success with it, I think. I oh, think he exactly. just released another pair recently. Yeah, Rick um, O'Berry is fantastic for us. I, you know, I, I think he's, he's done, he actually came to one of our capture commemoration events a couple of years ago. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he, he... Parlay that kind of success into something to boost this project. It should. It should. Um, it depends on, you know, how the media play it, really. You know, what's the perception in the public mind? And, you know, they don't pay enough attention to that. Pete Bethune and Rick have gone to the demos, you know, the protests at the Sequarium. They're, they're great supporters. Ingrid Visser has helped design our whole plan. Uh, so she's, there's support out there. Yeah, yeah, there is support out there. Um, so, you know, those are sort of our challenges, how to generate that support, how to, how to make it the consensus, you know, the scientific consensus. You know, if we can talk science, I think we can, you know, we can win, but we don't have those conversations. You know, we can, we can show that it's entirely viable. You know, the, the fear is, what if it doesn't work? You know, which implies that they think it won't work. 
and there's, I, you know, I, show me where. <laughs> where is there going to be a problem? Where is there going to be trauma or stress or you know any harm done? I don't see it. If you can, you know, help us figure that out, we'll fix it. But um, if you just say, well, in general, I have this fear about it, that's going to be the public perception, and that's what it is right now. So that's sort of what we have to deal with. On a lighter note, yes. May I just say because we mentioned on team and um, the the aquarium there, marine marine land, and uh, there were a lot of nonsenses coming over what had happened to this this whale during this flooding event. So I thought the only way you're going to get an answer is to go over there and find it out. So I eventually got there. Uh, I started loitering with intent um, <laughs> and taking photographs of a car park which was this deep in mud and silt and this is the car park for that aquarium and I thought I, I really would like to get in but it was a bit like uh, uh, the Bank of England <laughs> and the vaults <laughs> you know it was so heavily guarded I thought I don't know I'm not going to get this anyway a guy happened to wander along and he sort of got a, uh, a, a little hat on he was a youngster and I said yeah I've got any idea I can get some views from this place he said yeah he said follow me in French but okay, understood that. So he said, yeah, 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 I've got a good idea. So we go walking all around the perimeter of this fairly large bit of land that the aquarium opens, and I get up right alongside a crane, which is 200 foot tall, and has a jib going out another 100 foot. Oh, no. And he said, if we go up there, we'll get some good photographs. <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to do it a different way. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'll go back to loitering with intent, which I did. And I thought, I bet that guy there is going to need a pee in a minute. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> I just walked in. Yeah. I, I was in there for about 15 minutes before they found me. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was chucked out unceremoniously. But I got some photographs. Good job. That's what it was. I got the photographs. So the, the, the terrible effect that this... This flood it caused, and they're yeah. just back in there again. It shut down all the power, so no pumping, yeah, and no. clogged up all the pipes. So yeah, they, they, would, they wouldn't answer emails, they wouldn't answer any telephones, no. nothing. They so shut themselves the right away down. Right? The water was not clear at all. No, for yeah. how long? Months? Yeah, oh yeah, a long, long time. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And consequently, a death. Right. Valentin lost it. It's amazing, only one. But yeah. Yeah. So they're in no position to take her, I do believe. Um, and also it's a huge drain, hundreds of millions, one estimate is 400 million to repair that park. Uh, so, you know, there, that may impact the whole corporation's, uh, you know, financial picture. So, uh, we'll see what that does. You know, we don't, we don't really know the thinking going on at headquarters at Parkless Rio Nidos right now. Got to be looking at the numbers and they don't show the numbers, so we don't know what they are. The revenues and the admissions and all that. So, uh, but just from background, it appears to me that they've got to be in financial strains right now and ready to make some big changes. So we could give them some great publicity if they would <laughs> like to work with us. Okay, uh, I don't know, but unless there's more, thank you very much for yeah. that. Uh, another quick thing, I'm just going to say it because I'm always so pleased when we get these people. Yeah. And these people. Yes. Because you're going to have to take this on. When we can't do it any longer, you know, we're not getting younger. Well, he's not, I'm going to do it. But it's, it's absolutely great to see you. Thanks for taking an intro. My sentiment is that. Yeah.